Good morning. Good morning. Take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 15, if you will. Romans 15. It's nice, nice to be here. I, I don't get the op opportunity to be here very often with my wife, but for the past three decades, I've been coming up here teaching the, the TV program here. And uh, so it's kind of for me, this, this is the lectern that we use for the TV program, so I'm kind of familiar with this. And uh, it's nice to, usually we don't have as nice a looking crowd at the TV. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's just the way that works, you know. But uh, it is good, appreciate the ministry here, I have through the years with Brother Tom and, and the, the brother that with him, and now Brother Brandon, and the last few years. And it's, it's, it's an opportunity to, to just rejoice in, in things that uh, you get to participate in the local church. And the, and the work of the ministry. I know COVID has been a, you know, kind of a disruptive thing for the world. And because of that, and, and our ministry in Chicago, uh, I told our folks first of the year, I, I think that Romans 15 verse 13 is a verse that you ought to make, a, make your verse for the year. And what we've done is, there is this is sort of the verse that uh, I've always signed my name. And when I was, became a believer, uh, back in, in the 60s, everybody had a, a life verse. People don't do that so much anymore, but you had a life verse, you signed your name, you, and you wrote it, you know, you put the verse with it. And I wanted to use Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ and so forth. But that, my best, a, a good friend already had that verse. And I said, oh man, I can't, you know, you, you don't want to duplicate it right, right away. So I, I'm reading through Paul's epistles and I said, well, Here's the one I like, Philippians 121. I've always signed, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's sort of a, another reflection of Galatians 2.20. And this year I started signing, not along with it, Romans 15.13. Because I think that's a verse, you just look at the verse. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Every word in that verse is, is important. And it's sort of a, it's, he's, Paul's given a, a whole long statement here, and now he's going to transition into something a little different. And it, it's almost like a standalone verse. And it's just sort of so like Paul says, hey, wait a minute, here's something I've got to say. Now the God of hope, that's who God is, he's the God of hope. And when you read in Paul's epistles the issue of hope, uh, come over with me to Titus chapter 2. The, the term hope, when you see that in Paul's epistles, think the rapture. Because when he talks about hope, in every context, when you find it in, in Paul's epistles, it'll be looking toward the future. It'll be looking toward the blessed hope. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, he describes the Christian life, begins in verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us. Grace teaches you. People think that grace, you know, lets you go free and there's you know, no law or anything, but grace has something to teach you. God's riches at Christ's expense provided for you teaches you that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. People ask me, they say, what, what should a believer do when he sins? Stop. That's the thing to do because that's what the cross does. The cross stops sin. It's what it's designed to do. It puts away, so he put away sin by the sacrifice. That's what grace teaches you, that God, because of Calvary, put away sin. And when you see sin in your life, that's the sin he died to put away. So it teaches you to deny, you have no right in my life. It teaches denying godliness and world. You're, you're out. I'm going to put on Christ. That's how I'm going to live, uh, live soberly, righteously, and godly. Looking, the attitude that I'm doing, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the hope. And when you see hope in, in Paul's epistles, come, come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. The God of hope. There, if you live in the world we live in, it's hard to have much hope. You know, things just compound themselves to take away your hope. But the God of, of hope, when you think about the rapture, you know, you, 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 know, you know what the rapture is. You, you're going to be walking along one day and the Lord comes and boom, out you go. And that's the beginning. It's not the end. And sometimes we talk about the rapture and say, well, I'll well, look for the rapture. That's the beginning of things that are going to take place for eternity for you. 
And the hope of the rapture isn't just I'm getting out of these, these things here that are difficult and, and problematic and, 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 and harmful. I'm going to an eternal future. When I think of the rapture, I don't just think of the moment. I think of all that it's taking me into. Our hope isn't just to avoid some things that are happening in the world. Our hope is we're going some, to something that's absolutely fantastic. Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, well, verse 17, Paul is praying for the Ephesians that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. He's the Father of glory. God has a plan for the future to glorify His Son in His creation. He calls that plan glory. He's the Father. He's the one who originates it. And Paul prays to the Father who has this wonderful plan to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Now that word spirit there, you notice when he talks about the spirit of wisdom, they already had the Holy Spirit. Look at, back at verse 13. In whom you also trusted that you heard, when, when, after that you heard the word of the truth of the gospel. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So when you trust Christ, God the Holy Spirit comes and He does a number of things for you. One of them is He seals you in Christ. He indwells you. So the believer, every believer, until the redemption of the purchased possession, which is another way of describing the rapture, you have the Holy Spirit. They, they don't need God to give them more of the Holy Spirit. They already have the Holy Spirit. You don't get more of Him, you get Him. So verse 17, when he's talking about giving you the spirit of wisdom, and he's not talking about giving you the, the Holy Spirit, or he's not talking about giving you some kind of extra spirit, because the Holy Spirit's all you need. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is sort of like the verse where it talks about the spirit of slumber, this, that kind of thing, it's, it's an, the attitude. There is an attitude, a spirit, that wisdom and revelation gives you. It gives you some confidence, it gives you hope. And Paul's praying that the impact of who you are in Christ and, what, and, and what God, understand what God's doing would, would give these Ephesians the spirit of wisdom. There is, when you have wisdom and you have the revelation from God's Word, it gives you a spirit of, con it gives you confidence, it gives you boldness, and he wants them to have that. The impact of the doctrine. Doctrine is designed to impact your life, not just intellectually, but personally. The eyes, and, and by the way, you notice this, the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of him. It's not getting to know yourself better, it's getting to know him better. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Why? That you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power? He's not just wanting them to know the hope of their calling, the, 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 the calling, not just wanting them to know the inheritance. He wants you to know the hope associated with his calling. He's the God of hope. He provides a future for us that gives us an attitude of wisdom and revelation, gives us his hope. And there's the, the hope that's associated with it. There's the riches of the glory in his inheritance. You, read, you know, I read those things and I say, you read that and meditate on it a little bit and you can't do anything but get happy about it. It's something that makes you, fills you with joy and peace. The God of hope fill you with joy and peace. The hope that he gives us is designed to fill us with joy and peace in believing. When we believe these things, it gives joy and peace. And if you keep reading verse number 20, the exceeding greatness of his power, which, uh, verse 19, to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at, at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. You see when he says he set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, Remember that, because we're going to look at some verses in a minute that are going to, going to call, call that issue back to mind. But when, he, when Christ is exalted, 
he dies, he's resurrected, he ascends into heaven. You know the verse, the Father said to, 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 to Christ, come sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. After that, he, he, he ascends up far above all heavens into the third heavens. And he's at the Father's right hand, the one who's going to accomplish all the things far above all principality and power. That's part of the program that we're involved in today. Verse 22, and hath put all things under him, his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. He exalted the Lord Jesus Christ over all the principalities, of all of the government. He made him the head of all things for us. It's to our advantage. Well, who are we? The church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's a staggering verse to me. The church, the body of Christ, and he says it that way because there's another church in the Bible. We're talking about the body of Christ church. We are the fullness of him. It's not just that we're going to fill all the heavens. He's going to use us to do it. With a full, you and I have a privilege of being some, we have a privilege of providing for the Lord Jesus Christ something that without us, it wouldn't be accomplished. We're the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's our future is to go fill all in all. Fill up all those positions up there, bring them under his, 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 uh, his headship. Heaven, eternity isn't going to be for you just sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, drinking mint and julep, whatever it is. You know, I was in Montana years ago and I was talking about some of this and uh, I, I made the statement. I said, you're not going to spend eternity catching rainbow trout out of the stream of life. And a little lady sitting right, like she says, what? <laughs> I've been looking forward to that. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I learned at the camp there that she was quite a fisherman because in every break during, in the afternoon in the camp, she'd go out down there to the stream and catch fish. And she, she I've been looking forward to catching fish out of the stream of life. Wow, I'm not going to, no, you're going to be too busy for that. Now you might get some R&R &R along the way. I always said in the millennium, I'm going to ask the Lord for about 400 years of R&R &R and go spend it in San Diego. But uh, <laughs> my wife doesn't like that idea. But <laughs> I live in Chicago. You know, anything's better than that, that for, for an R&R. &R. But um, your future isn't, and it's real. And it's going to be for His glory. That's the hope. God has a plan for his creation and a plan for us that is a, that, that is a wonderful thing. It's, that's why he calls it the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you think about the God of hope, go back to Romans 15. Think about it. Remember, every, and every time you see hope in Paul's epistles, if you think about that, it's not hope so. Um, not a hope so. Salvation. It's it's an anchor for your soul about the future that God has for you. The God of hope. Now, if you go back to verse number four, Romans fifteen four. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The hope the God of hope gives you is going to come into your understanding through the scriptures. This is not what you dream up, what you want life to be like. This is what does the scripture say. That's why it says, fill you with joy and peace in believing. It's God's word that gives you the truth about what the future is going to be like. And it's God's word that gives you the confidence for that, that hope to fill you with joy and peace. So this is going to have to come out of God's Word. If it's going to come out of God's Word, it's got to be God's Word rightly divided. My wife and I were here this weekend, the Bible conference in Wyandotte, and when we, when we drove down into that area uh, Friday, we got here, I told her that they always told me that that area was called Hillbilly, Hillbilly Haven because of all the people from Kentucky and Tennessee that moved up here you know, a generation ago for the, for the, the jobs in the automobile industry. And you can, you can ride, now we're from Alabama, so that means something to us, maybe it doesn't to you. But we would ride down the street, stop at a place, and, and you, you got a sense that, well, we might be in Tennessee. <laughs> and one of the things is, there's a, a Baptist church in every corner. 
and then there's a Methodist church, and there's all the, it's, and if you go down to Tennessee or Kentucky or Alabama, where we're from, it's, it's sort of that way. All kind of churches everywhere. And where we live, they're, they're mostly, mostly Catholic and Lutheran because that's what settled that area. But you think about all the different things out there, all the different religious uh, activities out there. Last Sunday in our assembly in, in, Chicago, in Rolling Meadows, after the meeting was over with, most people had gone home, there were two Muslim ladies came in, all in their gear, and brought a cake and some candy as a gift <laughs> because it's Ramadan and they're, they're out doing their, their, their good works. And they have a mosque meeting place you know, about four blocks down from where we are. And it's interesting to be able to try to share the gospel. You got any idea what goes on in a place like this? You know, oh yeah, we, we, know, we know about Jesus. I said, what do you know about Jesus? Well, he's, he was a good guy, you know, and Muhammad recommended him. And I said, well, you know, he's more than that. You have any idea about that? And no, no, don't know, didn't go very far. But there's all kind of religion. By the way, all those people have come to us. When I was coming up as a young man, the idea of going to a country, a Muslim country, and trying to reach Muslims, it was like going through the Iron Curtain. Now, they, more Muslims have gotten saved in the last 10 years than ever in church history because they've come here. And one of the, one of the, the uh, things where our country is open, you know, it's kind of sliding down from where it used to be, one of the things is, is that more people come here. And when they come here, they come into a culture that's different, it's that, that ironclad uh, constraint, and they hear the gospel. And you know, when people are religious and bound in religion, and then they hear the gospel, the grace of God, that has an impact, and it gives hope. Now the verse talks about the God of hope. You're gonna get that out of the scripture. You get it out of the word of God rightly divided. It's not just being religious. Religion doesn't give you much hope. Religion says you perform and you get and you know you don't, so now where'd your hope go? God's grace gives you hope because God provides it for you as a gift. You learn that in the scripture. That's why right division. Listen, that's why a ministry like this is so critical in the midst of all the confusion of the world. And it will become more and more so as the, as the, the culture changes, and our culture has changed, by the way, and I've been saying to people for, since the mid-1990s, the decade you li you're living in right now and you're about halfway through it is the most impactful decade you'll ever live in your life. I don't care what you, if you're as old as Jim is. <laughs> He's lived in a lot of decades, but this is the most impactful. Or if you're young and, and, and just starting out, this will still be the most impactful decade of your life. I understand the culture's changing. I understand what's going on. The anchor, the hope, is in that book. The hope is in God's Word rightly divided. It's not just holding up a Bible and shaking the Bible. So it's understanding what God's Word says. Have the eyes of your understanding enlightened that you may know what is the hope of your calling. When he says that the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. He wants your heart to be filled with joy, not happiness. Happiness is a different thing. Happiness is attached to happenings. You get, you, you rejoice in the things that happen in your life. Joy is something that's bigger than that. It's, it's attached to the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What God's done is your strength. Believing the hope that God has given you in His Son, that's where real joy Excitement not attached to happenings, but to a truth, and then gives peace. And you see where it says he wants you to be filled with that? That word filled, when you see that, come back with me to John chapter 16, if you would. Um, that word filled, we talk about being filled with the Spirit, being filled with joy and peace. I, I tell you what, go, instead of, go, go, go to Luke, Luke chapter 5. That word filled is the idea of being controlled by, gripped by, dominated by, controlled by it, to the place where, where, where it dominates your life. The thing that he wants to dominate your life as a believer is joy and peace. I, uh, 
you watch the news. That's a thankless thing to do. <laughs> you know, the best thing to do is just turn it off because it doesn't make any difference anyway in your life. But you get stirred up by that. It doesn't bring joy and peace. He wants you to have a joy attached to who God's made you in Christ and the peace that passes understanding that that brings. But he wants that to fill, control your life. That word fill, Luke chapter number five, I'm, I'm just using this as, as an illustration. Luke five, verse number 26. Now, there's some events taking place here. This guy gets healed and so forth. Start in verse 25. And immediately he rose, Luke 5, 25. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that where, whereupon he lay and departed to his own house glorifying God. So the guy gets healed. And they all, they were all amazed. And they glorified God and were filled with fear saying we've seen strange things today. No, it says they were filled with fear. You know what that is. They, they were, fear just took over their life and it dominates them and it controlled what they did. If you come over with me to chapter six, you'll see it again. This runs through the scripture all over. Chapter six, verse 11. Verse number 10, he says, and looking around about upon them all, he said unto them, stretch forth thy, the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Man's crippled, he puts his hand out, and it's restored. Everybody sees that. And they were filled with madness. <laughs> and commune one with another what they might do to Jesus. They didn't like it. So they're filled they're just gripped with anger and go about and try to kill him. When you're filled with something, it controls you to the place that it dominates everything about you. When he talks about being filled with the Spirit, same idea. So when he talks here in, in Romans, what God wants to dominate in your life is joy and peace. And it comes in believing. Come with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 12. What time do you quit, Tom? There'll be a bell. <laughs> you know, I'm looking back there for a clock, and it's on the wall over here. Preachers like that. You can't see it. <laughs> But the, yeah, I see that one now. <laughs> that one's hard to see. The problem with it is you can see it. <laughs> okay, good luck. You, you know what that, you know, you know what it means? My wife will tell you when I do that, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. When I, when I think of being, being filled with joy and peace and believing, Here's a verse of scripture that's always meant a lot to me about that issue. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two. He says in verse one, wherefore, seeing that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and that's all the that things in chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking under, here's the motivation that, 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 that is going to give them to run the race. And the race that's set before these people is tribulation. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. Notice that who for the joy that was set before, there's joy out there. There's something that's gonna be accomplished by that cross. Instead of looking at the sufferings and the difficulties and the problems and the hatred associated with the cross, he looked to the joy that was gonna be accomplished by it. And, and, he, 
he despised the shame. Big deal. He endured. So the endurance came in believing what God the Father had told him about what they were going to do because of the cross. For the joy. You focus on the hope. You focus on what's being accomplished. And instead of the moment, the difficulties, the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That's Paul's words in Romans 8, 18. This is a great illustration of it. And you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. He says, he sat down at the right hand of the throne. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 1, the book of Hebrews is designed, by the way, who would the book of Hebrews be written to? Kind of odd, isn't it? It tells you. It's the book of Hebrews. And it's written to the circumcision uh, believers specifically to explain to Israel and Israel's program and prophecy the issue of the cross work. Romans explains the cross for the body of Christ. Hebrews and, and God's plan in it for, for the cross. But Hebrews explains the cross in relationship to Israel's program. There are three great transition books in the New Testament. Matthew, you come out of the, out of the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets were until John. Now the kingdom of God is preached and all men press unto it. And Matthew is that transition between the, 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 the Old Testament prophecy being there and now it's at hand. The book of Acts transitions between the kingdom program being preached and the transition to the body of Christ, the, dismiss, the interruption of the body of Christ. The book of Hebrews is a transition back for Israel where they transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. And from the old covenant to the better things of the new. Seven times he talks in Hebrews about the better things, the better things, the better things that the blood of Christ provides through the new covenant. So it's a, it's a book of trans, transitioning Israel from the old to the new, new and living way provided through the blood of Christ. And they're going to need that, especially in the tribulation, because the Antichrist is going to come and claim to be the Messiah, and he's going to set up their temple and set up the Old Testament worship again, and he's going to draw them back into all of that Old Testament stuff. And you're going to have the believing remnant of Israel saying to them, no, 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 <laughs> he's, not the, he's not the Christ. The Christ already came. The one that says he's the Christ now that didn't come denies that one. He's the false one. He already provided the sacrifice. He already did the work. The one that, you, that, that, that you, you can't see, but you can believe because the scripture says it, that's the real one. And Hebrews is going to explain that and, and, and give sustenance and endurance to the, the, the believing remnant there. He starts out, verse number, chapter 1, verse number 3, talking about the Son, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholdeth all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now he's going to talk to, to you about, he's going to talk to them about what Christ accomplished because of the cross. Because he purged our sins, he then sat down. The work's done. Chapter 10 he'll talk about that. He'll quote that, that, that sitting down. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. He's going to quote it in just a second here. We'll see it. But the significance of that is in Hebrews 10, he says, all the priests go out every day, keep sacrificing, keep sacrificing in the temple. The only thing, they had all this furniture, but they didn't have a chair. Because the priest's work never was over with. Because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But Christ goes to Calvary, makes one sacrifice that takes care of sin forever, and he, the Father says, come sit down, the work's done. He didn't have to keep going. It's finished. Well, when he sits down at the majesty, right hand of the majesty, there's something now going to become, being made so much better than angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. There's something that he won because of the cross. Here's the joy. He's, he's looking at the cross, he's enduring the cross, he's going through all the shame and the difficulty of the cross, but he keeps in mind, hey, there's a future going to come because of this. He'll sit down at the right hand of the Father, exalted. Verse number five, he says, For unto the angels, unto which of the angels, said he at any time, Thou art my son. 
This day have I begotten thee. That's Psalm chapter 2. He could, he could, uh, he's looking at the cross and he can say, he put, in Psalm chapter 2, the Father speak, the, the nations speak, the world talk, then the Father talks, then the Son speaks, and he says, here's what the Father told me. And that's that verse right there. The Father says to the Son, thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. God the Father communicated to God the Son what was going to be accomplished, what he's going to do because of the cross work, for the joy that was set before him. Verse number six, again, when he bringeth forth the firstborn begotten into the world, he saith, and he, and he goes on down through, the, through those verses. Verse number eight, under the, under the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. That's a quote out of Psalm 45. God the Father says to God the Son, thy throne, O uh, 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 oh God. If you ever need a verse that talks to you about Jesus being God, God the Father thinks Jesus Christ is God. So how can that be? Well, the Godhead, they're all God. All these people in this room here, we're all human. I mean, some of us look less human than others, but we're all human. Equally. But there's a whole bunch of us. In the Godhead, there are three pe persons who share deity, like you and I share humanity, but there are only three of them. And God the Father looks at God the Son and says, Thy throne, O God. He's going to get a throne. He's going to have a kingdom. You know what he's going to get through the cross work? There's a kingdom coming where he's going to be exalted and glorified. Verse number 10, And thou, Lord, he says to the Father, the Father says to the Son, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth. And he talks about a new heaven and a new earth. That's a, that's a quote out of Psalm 102. In Psalm 102, we don't have the time to, well, to go back there. Go back to Romans. But what he does in Psalm 102 is, is one of the most fascinating things. The first part of Psalm 102 is is Christ talking. And he's talking about the sufferings. And actually, when you read it, you say, that's the cross. Then you say, but no, that's, that's a Jew in the tribulation. <laughs> in the Psalms, the Lord Jesus Christ is identified, numbered with, with his people. And you'll see suffering, and you'll say, well, that's, that's the, the remnant in the tribulation. And then you say, no, that's the Lord Jesus on the cross. And Hebrews quotes it and says, that's Christ. But when you get down through the psalm, all of a sudden, God the Father speaks to the Son. And the, the Son talks, and He talks about the sufferings and the difficulties, and the Father says, yeah, but look, look, look at what's going to come. You're going to get a kingdom for it. Then, then, then Christ speaks back, and He says, yeah, but man, this is tough. And the Father says, yeah, but boy, look at what's going to And that's where that, those verses there come from, the latter part of that, where the Father is speaking back to the Son, about the sufferings. For the joy, you see, the joy that was set before him is something that God spoke, put, and it comes in believing. So when you read, how do you get filled with joy and peace? That's the point. How was Christ filled with joy and peace so he would endure the cross? The joy. He put in his mind what the future is. What's really going on? That you may abound in hope. You abound in hope. <laughs> you can have hope, but then you abound in it. through the power of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God takes the truth of His Word and causes it to percolate up through you and abound. My wife will say, I'm teaching this verse so I can use this illustration. Years ago, was in, when I, we were in Alabama, we started a church in a little town in central Alabama, and I would go down to town and preach on the street corner, and I'd been doing that all my life. One day I was down there in front of Thompson Drug Store preaching, and when you, you preach on the outdoors, your voice goes out. And I, I'd gone into the drugstore, it's a hot day, and I, to get a, a drink. And I'm in, the, I'm in the drugstore, and there's this farmer, came, this guy, he must have been a farmer. He came in, he's in overalls, got in the top buttons undone, he's hot. And when he came in, I could tell he was in distress. And so I'm watching him, and he came in, and he went over to the Alka-Seltzer counter, and he got, the, he got the little pack of Alka-Seltzer, we get the two. And he went over to the, the, the drink section. 
you'll remember, you, you, got, you, you, you young people miss so much of life. <laughs> Coca-Cola used to come in a 16 ounce glass bottle. It was wonderful. It was cold. He went over and got that, took his thumb, popped the top off, put the alka so like, pop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is, and took that Coke and down on those alka -Seltzers. Now, you know that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and about the time he finished off that Coke bottle, he realized it wasn't a good idea. And that dude left that room burst out through the doors, and I'm thinking, I gotta go watch what happened. <laughs> I'm out there, he's on the parking, you know how parking meters used to be? He's on the parking meter, and it's white foam coming out his mouth like a, like a hose, coming out his nose, you'd think his ear, and just pouring out of him. You know what he's doing? He was abounding. <laughs> It was coming out, and he couldn't have stopped it. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you might abound in hope. That it just comes out, and you can't stop it through the power of the Holy Spirit. God takes his word, fills you, controls you, dominates you with the joy and peace that's your hope. And it causes you to abound in it. That's the way to get over the grunts and the groans of watching Fox News or CNN. <laughs> it's wonderful to be saved. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your love and your grace and the fact that it touches every area of our life for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.